Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 45, we're going to learn how to measure a tube amplifier's power output. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So if you've been following the progress of the 6P7S monoblock kit amp, you know its testing is up next. So I thought, why not make a tube lab showing the maximum, how the maximum power is determined? And we've come up with a name for the, the new amp. We're going to call it the Yuri, Y-U-R-I, named after Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space who was, of course, a Russian. And the tube that inspired this amp was, of course, made in Russia. So, let's get going. Now, it's not hard to do, it's not complicated, but you need a little bit of equipment. So, let's start off with the signal generator. So, that just gives us a fixed audio signal. And the convention for testing amplifier power is to feed a 1 kilohertz signal. So can you see that up here? The frequency is 1.0. And we have control of the voltage. Let me just drop that down. So we'll bring it up. We'll start at 1.5 volts. You see our sine wave over here? Okay, let's put this down. Now you might hear a little bit of noise and sort of a clipping sound and that's because we got enough electronics going that the camera mic is actually picking up the noise unfortunately so we'll shut everything down as soon as we can so we need uh, just a regular um, AC voltmeter an RMS meter and we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute we need a dummy load on the speaker out so we just use a power resistor now this is a 100 watt power resistor, 4 ohm. We could have tested it at, at 8 ohm. Um, this amp has two taps for the output. It has a 4 ohm and an 8 ohm, and my speakers happen to be 4 ohm. It wouldn't matter if, if we have a proper um, pair of taps on the output transformer. It wouldn't matter for our power test whether we do it at 4 or 8 ohms. I've done both. You get exactly the same number. Um, now, don't put your hand, your finger on top of a regular um, uh, dummy load resistor for a higher powered amp. They get extremely hot, so they need to be put somewhere safe where they can't catch something on fire. Now, I have a nice big heat sink plate that I bolt this thing to that'll dissipate the heat safely. But for this amp, it's a lower powered amp, so this will never get that, that hot. It just gets a little bit warm. So there's your dummy load, and we need a scope. Now, the uh, scope, the dummy load, and the voltmeter are all in parallel with the speaker output. Now all that means is that the positive of the voltmeter, <coughs> one side of the resistor, because there's no polarity on a resistor, and the positive on the scope are all on the positive out on the amp, and on the negative side, of course, we have the negative connections for each. And the, the scope is just clipped in over here. There we go. Okay, so how this happens is you just increase the signal at one kilohertz. You keep the, you keep the frequency exactly the same and you, you bring up the amp until it starts to clip. Now I've left channel two, the green line here in place so it gives you a nice clear differentiation between, there's grid lines, but they're hard to see on camera. Gives you a nice clear differentiation between the positive and the negative and the, where the zero point is, right? So what you do is you bring it up until the amp starts to clip. And now tube amps soft clip. They don't clip hard. If this was a solid state amp, they tend to clip very hard. They, they go for a long time until they don't, and then they clip. So that instead of being a nice soft thing, you'll see a big jagged um, crash, basically, of the signal. So here we've got a soft, a soft clip on the negative phase. If we bring it up a little bit more, 
the positive phase starts to soft clip and there it goes some more and some more and it's just getting flatter and more elongated. Now the signal is not 100% perfectly symmetrical but it's awfully close. So let's bring it down. We'll bring it down until we get rid of the clipping and we have a very nice clean signal. Bring it up and that's probably it. That's our maximum clean power in RMS. Let's go and grab um, a pad with our formula. So P for power equals V for volts squared over R for resistance, right? So there's our volts, 2.14. Our resistance is just the, the power resistor, 4 ohms, right? It could be 8 ohms, it just changes the math slightly. So 2.14 squared equals 4.58 over the resistance, which is 4, which equals 1.14 watts. Or let's just call it a 1 watt amp RMS. Now, what's RMS? That stands for root mean square. And basically what that is, is a mathematical formula that determines the portion of the electrical um, voltage that we measure that is usable energy. If you look at, if we were to put this on um, on your household voltage here in North America, it's 120 volts AC. Elsewhere, it's going to be 220, 240. But if we were looking at 120 volts, we would see, if we did peak to peak measurement, we would see that it goes way beyond 120 volts positive and way below 120 volts negative. All of that um, peak to peak voltage is not usable energy. The 120 volts, the portion we see in a regular, now this is not household voltage, right? We're looking at one kilohertz, but if we had uh, 60 cycles or 50 cycles, depending on where you live, if we had that sine wave up, it's the port, the main body of the signal that is usable energy. And that's what RMS is. So one watt RMS is essentially the maximum continuous duty power output capability of this amp. Does that mean that it can't go more? No. If it has a short transient spike, it probably can do a lot more than a watt. It just can't do it continuously. Okay, let's shut down and we'll talk a little bit about why uh, I'm fooling around with a one watt kit amp. Let's get that out of the road. I'm just going to unplug this. I'm not sure what the noise source is. I filmed this once and it got noisy at the end and it wasn't pleasant. So we're filming it again. <laughs> um, you see how the signal decays? So let's, all this equipment shielded, but you know, all the cables are shielded, but something is noisy. So let's just Turn this off. Somehow I figured out how to put it in standby mode. <laughs> Let me unplug it. There's always a way. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a new scope. I love this hand tech. Um, my previous scope was a really nice four channel computer based scope, but there's no way to put it conveniently on camera. Well, there's probably a way to do it if you're a high tech guy. And my son could have done it, but he's not here. So anyways, um, so what are we talking about with a one watt amp? What, why in the world am I fooling around with a, a single watt? Well, because of the sound quality. This is, this is a single ended um, beam powered tetrode and single ended amps have a couple of qualities that, that really uh, differentiate them from the more common higher powered push-pull amps like the Wilsonton R8 that's a good example and there's a whole bunch of them out there in fact the most common amp you'll buy uh, today is going to be uh, probably a four output tube class AB push-pull lots of power lots of drive great bass so if you have inefficient speakers that's your path that's the only way you can go but if you're like me and you like to listen to modern world jazz, the likes of 
Anwar Braham. You've heard me talk about his music. It is absolutely glorious acoustic jazz. Um, it's often recorded in um, halls with beautiful live um, acoustics. And on a single ended amp, it's about as close to heaven as you can get. I'm going to try and describe the sound with, with single ended designs, good single ended designs, and this is one. You'll get um, a lot of really good micro detail. Not just detail, you'll hear virtually everything in the recording. And not pronounced, it'll just be there as it's supposed to be there. You know, some some amplifiers will pull out uh, the details and sort of stick them up in front of you. And that can get very tiring very quickly. So with the micro detail and the clarity, these amps are extremely clear sounding. And this one actually is very low noise, which is, it's actually the quietest amp I've ever owned. I'm not even sure why. Now I've, I've put all of my design and build experience into the amp. Um, and I think I just got lucky, to be honest with you, you know. But um, maybe someday I'll discover the, the secret mix. Maybe I have discovered it. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> Anyways, um, with that clarity and the detail, you get a great stereo image. And with a great stereo image uh, comes a lovely sound stage. Now, if that wasn't enough, if you're running... Uh, higher efficiency speakers, and we'll talk about them in just a minute, you get a very dramatic musical presentation. In fact, the first time I heard a single ended amp, um, in fact, my, my main system single ended amp for a long time was my, my the first monoblock I ever built. And it's a 6L6 design, much higher power than this. Um, I was just blown away by the immediacy of the, of the music. One of the goals of many audiophiles is to get as close to a live presentation as possible. Now, to get that, the recording has to be superb. And it has to have been meant. The engineer, uh, engineers on the job, the producer, the musicians, the equipment, everything has to be up to snuff. And they all have had to have been aiming towards that kind of presentation. Um, and if they succeed, and they do once in a while, maybe 1% of the time. <laughs> um, and those are cherished recordings. Um, an app like this will just bring the music alive. And it'll be glorious. Okay, so in order to make a lower powered amp sing, you need a higher efficiency speaker. Now mine are not about 93 dB. They're custom design. And only a handful of years ago, it wasn't common to be able to get high efficiency speakers. Uh, you'd have to go with a Klipsch. Now, there's nothing wrong with Klipsch. I'm just saying that there weren't, there wasn't a lot of selection. Nowadays, uh, the very popular and affordable Klipsch uh, RP600M is 96 dB. Now, that's only like 3 d more than my speakers, right? Um, and that that can't make much of a difference, can it? Well. Uh, roughly speaking, every 3 dB in inc increase in efficiency doubles the volume. Let me repeat that again. Every 3 dB of increase in speaker efficiency, the volume doubles. Isn't that amazing? So it's not a linear curve, right? Um, so the, um, the, the, the little clips is twice as efficient as my speakers. Or, sorry, that's not right. <laughs> it's It'll play twice as loud for the same given input signal. How about that? And even uh, companies like Zoo have a good selection of um, highly efficient speakers around 97 dB. Now, to give you an idea how loud one watt is, I have a moderate, modest-sized living room, so it's not very big, which is common these days, which is one of the reasons why I'm putting my focus on smaller um, stereo pieces of tube gear because a lot of us just don't have space and can't afford space. Um, you know, I live in one of the most expensive rental markets in Canada and, um, and many people around the world are stuck in the same situation. So we have to, you know, we have to do with smaller listening rooms. 
I actually have a customer who has two <laughs> has two listening rooms, and I thought that is decadent. That's the meaning of decadence. So you can have two complete systems, of course. And a lot of people have an upstairs and downstairs, you know, in the living room, in the rec room. I have a good friend who lives down the road from me who has a system like that. Anyways, I digress. So how loud can it get? Well, in an in-systems test, I actually had to put on my shop hearing protectors. That's how loud it got. It got, it got loud inside the hearing protectors. So one watt with a reasonably efficient speaker starting at about 90 dB in a modest sized room is going to be fine for most music. Okay, um, let's move on to what came in. Now, it just so happened that this week a lot of new old stock, new in the box um, tubes arrived. So NIS, NOB, right? Let me grab the first ones. So that'll be the theme. And it's it's getting harder and harder to find good amounts of inventory that are are that are essentially new tubes. And, you know, new tubes that are 40, 50, 60, 70. And we're gonna look at a oh man, how old is that tube? We're gonna look at an 80-year-old tube in a minute. Maybe even 90. So this is what the RCA clear top. Our clear dome looks like brand new out of the box and look at that the print on these things was so crappy that it's it was rubbing off and fading in the box now it's been in and out of the box a few times the seller probably pulled it out a couple of times and I pulled it out a couple of times they need to be tested so the prints rubbing off already and I think we already lost the date code but anyways these are probably some of the nicest North American made 12AU7s, and probably the nicest top end of any 12AU7 ever made, bar none. This, the crispness, the clarity, and the sparkle on the top end of these clear tops is just, just wonderful. A whole bunch of them came in, so they'll be in the store on the weekend, and uh, about as many uh, um, used versions came in as well. Now, one of the common questions I get is, how long is my vintage tube going to last? Well, obviously, a quality tube like this, new old stock, new in the box, is going to be your best bet. But they're not cheap. So, the next best thing, which is more commonly available, is going to be a good used tube. So, a high testing number is a good indication that we've got a tube with low hours and lots of life in it. That's the key. Okay, what's next? Oh, a couple of rebranded Mullard XF2 EL34s. Now, everybody knows I specialize in these. We're not going to hold against... Let me put this down. Dropping these is not an option. <laughs> We're not going to hold it against these tubes that they came rebranded RCA because if we look for the, the etched manufacturing codes, they're nice and clear. So XF2, so that's the 1960s Mullards. And you can see at the beginning here the capital B. So that's Blackburn. So that's that's the most common XF2 out there. And um, the whole series from 1960 to 1970, roughly. I'm still documenting the years of manufacture. So roughly that decade in the 60s were all made in Blackburn. Now, um, Phillips, who owned Mullard, um, did make EL34s, particularly, I think, the next... Uh, series X3, XF3, XF4, that was the end of it, uh, made um, quite a few of them in Belgium, I believe, but I'm not certain about that. I don't specialize them. XF2, that's the that's my tube. I think this is probably the, um, the, the, the best sounding EO34 ever made. Okay, next. Let me put those down safely. <laughs> okay, we're going to go back in time. Have a look at that. That's right away. You know, it's a military box. They're beautifully packed. U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, tube, Gen, Joint Army, Navy, CHS, 12 SN7 GT, Sylvania, Electric Products, Inc., acceptance date. That's the date that the Army or Navy or the Pentagon, whatever, uh, brought these tubes into their own inventory. So they accepted them on 544, so May 44, so 
late in World War II. So this is a World War II vintage tube due in the box. That's not common anymore. Let's see if we can get them open carefully. Now they've been open once to test. Oh my, look at that. Can you see the elevated black T-plates with the large waist chrome? This is a 12 volt bad boy, brand new in the box. <laughs> wow. Now in the roster of amps um, that will become hopefully kit amps, first we've got to build a prototype. I'm working on um, a, a, a preamp that will be able to safely play the earlier lower spec 6SN7, the GTs. It'll be a 6 or 12 uh, volt preamp, so it'll be a dual voltage preamp. Just like the other 6 or 12SN7 prototype that I've got. But this one will be specifically to play these older tubes safely. The later version, the GTA and the GTB, they're just fine in virtually any any circuit. But these, they, they need a specifically lower a lower demand, a lower powered circuit for them to operate in safely. Or they get noisy. Or worse, they die. Okay, what's next? Keeping up the theme of new in the box. Now, all these came in in the last couple of days. Don't you love the early um, design work of Sylvania? Isn't that be just beautiful? They got the S for Sylvania in the shape of sort of a lightning bolt with the lightning bolts on it. I love lightning bolts. <laughs> Oh, the box is already falling apart. These are great. These early boxes from the 20s, 30s, and 40s are just great. You see that inner cardboard sort of corrugated sleeve? They really nestle the tube in there just beautifully. Look at that. Look at that. Look at the number 42. Now, this is an early pentode power tube. Another low power, low output power tube. You can maybe get and single end it, maybe you get 0.8 watts from this. Look at the waste chrome and the 42 is just gleaming. Now this is a six pin, so it is an indirectly heated tube. So it is a modern tube in that sense, because not long before this, we'd have um, directly heated tubes. So we'd just have four pins and the cathode would share the heater. Anyways, let's put that aside carefully. What else did we get? Oh, I saved the best for last. Have a look at this. This is a Meltz 1578. Now, this is supposedly the greatest 6SN7 ever made. And they are extremely expensive. I've seen match pairs for up to $1,000 US. Look at the plate. Can you see that? Let me grab the other one. It might be a little clearer. Let me keep carefully put the other one away. There you go. Okay, now you can see it. See all the, these holes lined up in the plate? I call that sort of like a machine gun barrel plate. And um, these, of course, are, are brand new. Now, the 1578 is the military designation for the Russian 6H8C which in English is the 6N8S, which is the equivalent of the 6SN7GT. And we we're just talking about a 12SN7GT. So this is a tube that would play in that lower powered preamp. And if you want to know if a tube is really new old stock, have a look at the pins and they're pristine. The bases on the new old stock are Russian tubes in particular, especially the metal bases, often are a bit beat up. And the reason for that is the Russians didn't take care of their tubes in bulk storage. I've seen pictures of them just thrown into a big box. Brand new tubes. That's how they were That's how they, they were stored at some point. Now maybe the bulk packaging rotted out or got wet and somebody just salvaged the tubes. But they get beat up a little bit. Does that change how they're going to sound? No, of course not. How they're going to sound is going to be determined by the quality of the original tube and how good they're testing, right? So... I'm, I'm really looking forward to an app that can play these safely. I, I don't dare put them into my more modern designed. I have um, a couple of amps that play 6SN7. I have a whole bunch actually. Um, it's one of my, 6SN7 is one of my favorite sounding tubes. So I've got them as driver stages in, um, in my first 6L6 monoblocks. I've got them in preamps. Uh, I've got them in the Wilsonton R8. So anyways, um, 
We'll get an amp built for these beauties. Now, I'll take a look at the date code. Can you see that? 1984, 03, so March of 84. I didn't even know that Meltz made the metal bases all the way up till 84. So that changes things. Most of my Meltz tubes are all from the 1950s into the early 60s. Okay, let's just put that down carefully. Well, if you've stayed to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.